Would you please stay standing for a moment? Sorry about that. <laughs> Excuse me, Deacon. Uh, you probably think I'm a little crazy, but uh, if you would uh, be willing, please, would you please turn around? Thank you. In that simple gesture, stay that way, if you would, for a moment. In this simple gesture, I have reoriented the direction of your attention, if you will. Would you please turn around? Turn around. No, no, I'm sorry. You are very obedient. You remember that Simon Says game? No, I didn't say. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Okay, turning around. That's where I was. Uh, turning around. The uh, word that we have in the scriptures and the word we have from the church is repentance. That's what... The word repentance means is to turn around. And in the Latin language, we have uh, interpreted and added to that concept of repentance in calling it conversion. Turn about. Those of you that work in the financial systems or maybe those of you that work in gas and electric and all that kind of stuff, you know that whenever a commodity changes uh, so its nature or its possession or its consistency, we call that it's converted. So, I don't know if you've gone to a foreign country and you take your American dollars and you convert them into, let's say, euros. You know, you always lose something. That always costs you something. There's, there's a cost in conversion. There's a cost in conversion. And this pr process of turning around or repentance, or conversion. Uh, the Greek word underneath it is metanoia. And it's what St. Paul was saying today in the letter to the Ephesians, the second reading. He says, change or turn your mind around. Change your mind. Change the way that you are going about knowing. And what the spiritual fathers and masters would say to us, what we are called to do in every uh, moment of prayer and consciousness, but especially in every moment of worship, is we are to change the direction in which we are looking for happiness. So I asked you to turn around, and I changed the orientation. I redirected the orientation of your perception and your mind physically. So that would be uh, for you kinetic learners. Maybe that was, oh, yeah, I see that. I turned about and I began to perceive this room in completely a different way. Repentance, metanoia, conversion. This is what Jesus is saying to the people who have come after him because as you heard in this great uh, bread of life discourse, he has just multiplied the loaves and the fishes. He has fed them fill with their bellies he was certain they were going to carry him off to make him king or uh, declare him to be the prophet, who, the long-awaited prophet who was coming to fulfill Moses. And so he got out of there and went to another place. And now they have come after him. And he says to them, you know, you are coming after me not for the right reason, not because you've seen signs. In John's gospel, the fourth gospel, uh, from which we are reading the Bread of Life discourse, the the miracles are not called miracles, they're called signs. Because they're just not wonder workers. It's not just to get people's attention or to convince people of my power. They are signs, the Bible says in John's Gospel. They are signs because they are revealing the presence and the power and the will of God through Jesus so he said, you are not coming after me because you've seen the sign. You are coming after me because your bellies were filled with bread. Huh? 
Jesus asked him, and St. Paul echoes it so beautifully in the second reading. Uh, uh, Jesus asked them, stop pursuing bread that will not last. Stop pursuing the bread that does not satisfy. Rather, seek the bread that lasts forever. Change the direction in which you are looking for happiness. Change the direction you are looking for happiness and fulfillment. St. Paul says, stop giving in to these deceitful desires. You know, that's an echoing, isn't it, of the, uh, the serpent in the garden, the deceiver. He says to Adam and Eve, oh, come on. You don't believe that God's going to kill you, do you? You don't trust. Yeah, maybe I don't. The deceitful desires of your belly, sisters and brothers, in my belly, you know? My spiritual director used to tell me, listen, you will never make any progress in controlling uh, your, uh, your life in holiness if you can't control your belly. You know? If you cannot discipline the deceitful desires and demands of our self-fulfilling uh, pleasures, hmm? lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, if we cannot discipline ourselves in that regard, well, there is no way that we are ever going to lay down our life for the love of God in others. You've got to start somewhere, right? You've got to start somewhere. And so St. Paul and Jesus are calling the followers to re-examine their motives. Why are we doing what we're doing? And as maybe you, some of you uh, heard my preaching last week and the first week of the Bread of Life Discourse, I have, like the bishops of the United States, uh, they planned out the Eucharistic Congress last July in a five-day setup, and each day it was structured around the Mass. So last week was the calling or the gathering. Uh, the second day was the penitential rite. So you're supposed to be recognizing the parts of the Mass in these five days. The gathering, the penitential act, then the liturgy of the word, then the liturgy of the Eucharist, and then the final day was the sending rite, the dismissal rite. And so I'm kind of thinking that maybe it is that Jesus, the good shepherd, remember uh, two weeks ago, Jesus looked at the crowd that had followed him, and he looked at them with pity, it said, because they were like a shepherd with a sheep without a shepherd. And so I'm thinking that Jesus, the good shepherd, has drawn us to, through the scriptures, but also us good Catholics, through the Holy Mass, to understand uh, these essential uh, characteristics of Jesus' ministry. He calls us and identifies us. He gathers us into his congregation, into his family, into his discipleships, into his body, if you will. And so we are called to gather here in the church. And then, of course, as he did in the scriptures today, he says, wait a minute, why are you here? Let's reorient the desires and the motivations of your heart. And so this week, I'm thinking about that penitential act and that call to turn around. So I don't know why you're here. You know, there's many reasons to be here, right? There are many motivations. So some of you might be here because my mom and dad said I have to go. And if I don't go, we can't go out for pancakes afterwards. I don't know. So however they're arranging it. Or my father would say, listen, if you want to eat in this house, then you're going to observe our rules. So uh, that might be some insight into how I became a, a rather uh, conscientious rule observer, right? That's not a very high motivation, but I'll take it, right? I'm glad you, anybody who's here, because your mom told you you had to be here. I'll take it. How about, uh, maybe some people are here because they are, have been convinced that if you don't go to Mass on Sunday, you have a mortal sin. Not the highest of motivation, but I'll take it. Huh? And if that's what it takes to get you to come to Mass, then I think, okay, I can see the methodology here. But this cannot be... Uh, the highest level of freedom and the most enthusiastic 
uh, aiming at God for the fulfillment of your uh, desires is to avoid getting punished. You know, on uh, what's his name's hierarchy, Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs, you know, uh, avoiding punishment probably is uh, uh, not uh, too far up there. Maybe uh, someone, uh, have you ever heard this? Um, uh, I just, I just uh, get, I just feel, I don't feel right if I don't go to Mass. You know? I just, it makes me feel, it feel good. So you're thinking, well, what's wrong with that? Well, that's not the mess. But once again, it's about you, right? I'm going to Mass because it makes me feel better. <laughs> How about the opposite of that? Uh, have any of your teenagers told you after Mass or uh, that I don't get anything out of it? I don't get anything out of Mass. Hmm. Well, if your motivation was to get something out of mass and you're not getting it, then I could see where that's revealing your motivation. You know, it's all about me. It's all about uh, what am I getting. So uh, I'm thinking Jesus is saying to the folks, let's examine again what is the desire and what is the frailty in our motivations. What is, the, what is the injury in our relationship with God? What are we looking for in life for happiness rather than looking to God, be, being turned about? What, what is our life oriented around? And how is it that Mass, coming to Mass, fits into that? And how is it that the church, in her wisdom, has, throughout the ages, begun this holy celebration with the invitation to purify our motivation, to purify our selfishness, to pur put aside our distractions, maybe to uh, heal and bind up and tend to the wounds that life has foisted upon us and our choices have brought upon us in our sin. That's what we call the penitential act. And so I'm seeing our good Lord Jesus. He calls the sheep and gathers them to himself. Then he... Uh, ushers into us, he looks at what the, us with compassion, and he sees the wounds, he sees the brokenness, he sees the boredom, he sees the selfishness, he sees the distraction, he sees the animosity, he sees the brokenheartedness. And he says, come to me, let me heal it. But in order for me to heal it, you're going to have to put that down and pick up my mercy so, sisters and brothers, let's uh, reflect again on, one, the blessing of a Catholic life and Catholic faith and Catholic spirituality. Two, the blessing of the Eucharist that is uh, the center of our lives as Catholic. And three, uh, particularly today, the blessing and the gift of repentance and grace and the opportunity to turn around, to make our lives more deeply oriented toward God's will, God's presence. You know, the reason to come to Mass is not to get something. The reason to come to Mass is to give something. It is to give right praise to God. And as the Bible tells us in another place, if you come to the altar to offer your sacrifice, and there, you remember something that your brother has against you or your sister. He says, leave your offering in front of the altar and then go. Be reconciled with your brother or sister. And then come and properly offer your sacrifice. Let us, in every Mass, be reconciled to God in our hearts Forgive others and ex uh, receive the healing of Almighty God for our sins. In that way, we can offer right worship, properly oriented to the God who loves us. With those of